I know what you're thinking. Really, Lawson? Another driving shot? But hey, give it a chance. This one's in slow motion. And driving is one of the primary modes by which I get from one place to another. And there's one specific place that I've been trying to get to my entire life. A place that I as yet cannot point to on a map and say, here, here it is. Because it's not a place that exists on a map. It's a place that exists in your heart. And that place is called home. People define home in a lot of different ways. For some, it's safety. For others, it's a place you recognize. For me, recently, I've really been trying to find a place where I belong. I've been looking for a life with meaning, meaning beyond the buying of trinkets on birthdays and holidays, beyond vain social competitions where we measure each other by how much money we make and how many people we've slept with. Bertrand Russell said that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. And my number is going to be forgotten way before that. So like many others, I wander the earth looking to connect with something more permanent, something more meaningful, something upon which generations of humans have cultivated gardens of myth and ritual, the fertile soil which fed the growth of countless faiths and religions and motivated so many people to just frickin' get out of bed and do their boring jobs every morning, and which, for reasons we won't get into today, at least not too much, American society has largely thrown out with the rest of the garbage. Today my journey takes me to Sedona, Arizona, home of a huge amount of vortex energy, a lot of retirees, and also my friends Laura and Paul, who are the current directors of the Cuyamangue Institute. But first, on the drive up from Phoenix, I had to stop at a beautiful place called Arcasanti. Located 70 miles north of Phoenix, Arcasanti is an experimental town inspired by the concept of arcology, the integration of architecture with local ecology. It's one of the brain children of Italian-American architect and designer Paolo Soleri, who studied with Frank Lloyd Wright and settled in Arizona in 1956. His main workshop, called Casanti, is located in Paradise Valley in the Phoenix metro area and is widely known today for the eponymous ceramic and bronze wind chimes that are crafted there. But Soleri's vision always had a grander scale. He came up with a multitude of designs for buildings, bridges, and cities, all with an emphasis on sustainability and resourcefulness. I know where I've seen this one. It's Star Wars. This is the bridge on Kashyyyk. 100% chance. Unfortunately for those closest to him, there is an incredibly dark side to Solari as well. In 2017, four years after his death, one of his daughters publicly revealed a long history of abuse by her father. After key members of the organization and close friends of Soleri himself had known and ignored her story for many years, the Cassanti Foundation ultimately concurred with her allegations of his narcissistic personality and abusive behavior. As Soleri's legacy is reconsidered, the micro-city here at Arcasanti and the workshop in Paradise Valley provide creative space for a new generation of artists. Many of their ideals differ greatly from Soleri, but he shared their vision for a more sustainable future. While critical aspects of his mindset and behavior were all too characteristic of celebrated men of his era, in his architecture, Soleri seemed to truly be thinking ahead of his time. Sitting here at Arcasanti with this 
endless expanse of natural beauty behind me and in every direction. You can't help but think that there's something about the Arizona wilderness that inspires people to reconnect with their natural roots. What's exciting is learning about all of the different ways that people have figured out to do just that. The Cuyamunga Institute of New Mexico is a self-identified non-religious organization that uses postures to help participants achieve ecstatic trance experiences via a ritual process that prominently features sonic supportive trance by the sound of a rattle or drum. While the purpose of the practice, which the Institute has referred to in such terms as ecstatic trance postures and ritual body postures, is ostensibly spiritual in nature, apparent benefits for physical and emotional health have been reported by participants and observed in empirical studies carried out in collaboration with the CI. Hello, I'm Robinette Kennedy, and I'm here with Felicitas Goodman, who is a psychological anthropologist. And, and Felicitas has just finished conducting a weekend workshop of ritual trance postures. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that Felicitas has done surrounding the postures and some of the theoretical perspectives that she has developed in her work. I have always been interested in religious behavior, and I came across a number of different accounts about uh, uh, various customs. And it seemed to me such a jumbled story. Uh, they would say, well, you know, these spirits appear and then uh, um, they disappear and then uh, uh, they come up as something else. And so a very, very strange uh, situation. It seemed like a picture uh, that somehow was viewed through a broken prism. The work of the Institute was begun by Dr. Felicitas Goodman, a linguist and anthropologist who translated hundreds of research documents that discussed traditions of ritualized altered states of consciousness. In the process, she noticed recurring patterns, and she ultimately reverse-engineered what she believed to be the essential elements of ritual that could be used to support altered states of consciousness. She combined her ritual with a hypothesis that many ancient pieces of art that show anthropomorphic beings in specific postures are in fact instructions, with each posture supporting a different type of trance experience. Goodman constructed several rustic buildings on land she owned in New Mexico, near a village called Coyamangue, which is said to mean where the rocks are fallen, in reference to the ruins of an older settlement nearby. Here, where Goodman shared her work with hundreds of visitors and friends over the next few decades, the Cuyamangue Institute was born. But today, as always, the Cuyamangue Institute is more than just a place. It's people, the directors, Laura and Paul, and those who make up the Cuyamangue Institute family the folks who attend rituals on Saturday mornings and lectures on Sundays and take what they've learned and share it back with their own communities at home. Since the start of the COVID pandemic, the people of the Cuyamangue Institute have had to become particularly resourceful, adapting what was originally a fully in-person ritual experience to function over Zoom. As a consequence, the work is now more accessible to the general public than ever before. Laura and Paul, the directors of the Institute, also relocated themselves, and it's here in Sedona, Arizona, surrounded by this wondrous natural beauty, that I will be meeting with them and learning more about their story. I found the Queen Monkey Institute through inviting Dr. Felicitas Goodman, anthropologist, to the radio talk show that I was hosting. And um, I had been asking the question, after listening to many guests talk about various other traditions mm -hmm. that had more coherency and more beauty and grace, indigenous yeah. cultures. So I was left asking and pondering, well, who are my indigenous ancestors, Europeans? Mm -hmm. Where are those? How far back can I trace them? What did they believe? Were they part of all this? And I don't know that much about them. Yeah. And a caller called in. Um, and said, gosh, the person to answer that question from a unique perspective would be this anthropologist. So I dialed her up, and she said, yes, dear, in this very uh, charming uh, German-accented English. Uh -huh. 
and um, she told me a little bit about her work and I was like just some bell struck some chord struck and it yeah. just resonated and then after the interview where she explained some of her key concepts I'm like Dr. Goodman sign us up in addition to the radio program we really had created a media company yeah. which had included yeah. uh, book distribution publishing uh, we were working with authors and that at that time didn't have representation or were looking for someone to help with distribution and all that. Mm -hmm. So along with uh, the the world of publishing and wholesaling and retailing and, and just making uh, education materials widely available. So we ended up doing several hundred thousand types of publications that we sold. Um, he did. Yeah. And uh, so that was part of it. And then we had a staff of people in the whole thing. And so we ran the gamut. Similar to our conversation for exploration today, yeah. we really got to explore the world of ideas and it was Goodman's that called us yeah. forth to leave radio, which we loved, but to dive deeper into this work. She had history. She was an academic. She mm. was an anthropologist. She looked at the world's traditions and found an avenue for us Westerners to reclaim our own indigenous heritage. She carved a path without us uh, stepping on anybody else's toes. And the other was that I've had mystical experiences spontaneously since childhood, mm -hmm. and I know what that felt like. Today, people are constantly looking for things that are real and authentic. Organic foods, free-range chickens, craft beers. There's something essential to life that the daily grind of the nine to five in the modern gig economy simply doesn't provide. What is it? I think it's impossible to say. But more and more, people are recognizing its absence. And they come to places like the Cuyamungay Institute to try to fill that void. One of the burdens of, of the individual in their life is to try to uh, get themselves back to the, the, the way that they were at when they were young. Mm -hmm. Not in uh, simply being, you know, foolish and, and naive but in, in, in kind of that, that innocence mm -hmm. and that, that purity and that just openness to everything the around you. The childlike stance of yeah. all I wonder. Mm -hmm. And in, mm -hmm. in the beginning of uh, Dr. Goodman's Where the Spirits Ride the Wind, I think it's on the second page or there, the first page, somewhere in the first chapter, right. she says that uh, her observations of many traditional rituals from different parts of the world is that it seemed to her that the purpose of many of these rituals was to help uh, adults recapture what they had been able to experience more spontaneously in their mm -hmm. youth. And Carl Jung has written stories about when he was young and he was going through the confirmation process. He, he had all this excitement for it, but then he actually showed up and there was, it was just, it, for him and his experience, it was just words and it was disappointing because he expected something magical to happen. Do See, you find that for, for you yourselves and for people who come to the Cuyamunga Institute, it's a kind of a similar thing that maybe when they were younger, they were able to, to find this without really trying, right. but now that they're older, they're recapturing something that they had in their youth or, or, or they're, they're finding a new version of it maybe sometimes. It may she would that. say that okay. we're all ecstasy deprived in our culture. Mm -hmm. We don't have the rituals, mm -hmm. we don't have the ceremonies to access that commonly. We turn to drugs, right? I like this work because it's without drugs, because maybe it's activating those same pathways, but we can do it from within through a simple ritual. In the youth, we have less responsibility. We're allowed to just live more in the present moment. Like yeah. we decide, oh, I'm going to go play basketball, or I'm going to go do this. But we don't have a life of structure as much. We can just flow, mm -hmm. we're in a flow state. And then comes the responsibilities and what we consider to be adulthood pressing down on us. And all of a sudden, some of that flow of being spontaneous, being present, um, gets blocked, preoccupied with both past and, and future. And we miss out on the present moment experience. I know for myself as a youngster, the big breakthrough came for me probably in high school age, just at, toward, towards the end of graduating from high school, was that just that, that knowledge that um, there's, there's got to be something more that ties all this together. 
being something that, that grew up and having access to traditional religious experiences and being a part of that, I knew that that was very important to me, but I wanted to understand more and how it all can be integrated into my life. And it just one thing led to another where I was open, my world opened yeah. up, and I started finding more and more clues that opened the door for me and for my experience to manifest itself, to understand that I do not want to just grow old. I want yeah. to grow inward and outward. I want to integrate myself and and um, and understand and have a thirst for knowledge and never let that thirst go away. Two key empirical studies were carried out in collaboration with the CI during Goodman's lifetime. One, by Ingrid Muller in Munich, observed intriguing physiological changes during posture-based ecstatic trance, including a shift in brainwave frequency. The other, carried out by a group in Vienna led by Gisler Gutmann, observed high-amplitude brainwaves, which could indicate intense mental effort or focus. Brainwaves are quantitatively evaluated by two primary metrics, frequency and amplitude. When we categorize brain waves into alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and theta, we're talking about the frequency. This is a representation of the temporal distance between waves, measured from peak to peak and reported as a value of hertz, or cycles per second. Theta brain waves are associated with creativity and with lighter stages of the sleep cycle wherein dreams occur. Over the years, a number of studies have also observed theta waves during deep meditation. In the laboratory, uh, where Goodman was invited to the University of Munich Polyclinic back in the 80s, and they were um, using the EEG and um, hormone levels and, um, and other methods. Indeed, you find the expanded state of a waking dream, mm -hmm. beta plus theta, simultaneous brain waves. That's possible, it's just not common. Yeah. You also see a lessening of the cortisone and stress hormones and a huge surge of the beta endorphins, the, the hormones of well-being and joy. Our ancestors knew this, cultivated it. It's also interesting that within a workshop setting, by the end of it, a group of strangers will bond and become a tribe. And when you relate from the soul and you have these shared experiences, that kind of bonding um, and, and sharing leads to peace and harmony. And so that was important also to our ancestors mm -hmm. living in small groups. The way I like to think of it is sort of when you talk about the ordinary reality that we experience every day, especially in Western culture, what we consider to be ordinary reality, and then the alternate reality. This is where Dr. Goodman liked to use that term, alternate reality, to express that realm of experience that goes beyond the physical that we all have. Indigenous people worldwide understood that they had a foot in both worlds and they didn't have a judgment about the fact that it's okay to be into this, this dreamlike state. In fact, it was, it, you were abnormal if you couldn't enter into those states. Exactly. Yeah. And so what we, we look at with this work is that we're opening the doorway to a normal state of being. Mm -hmm. It's abnormal not to have access to that full realm and deny ourselves the full uh, expansion of what the human experience can be. What makes your work different from meditation? You know, when you look at the world of meditation, there is a practice there that allows us whatever practice that is. It gives us that inner knowingness, that knowledge experience, that drawing from deep within ourselves. The world of meditation is a fantastic way for us to have a practice that integrates us to the, the most silent parts of ourself. The ritual body postures is that opportunity for us to be involved in, to use the word ecstatic, uh, an energy level of energy that's giving us permission for that visionary state. Meditation sometimes is about going to the inward, close, cl inward eye. And close, emptying the mind. And emptying okay. the mind. Not mm -hmm. all meditations are that way, but that's a, a more formal way of thinking of meditation. And this is about allowing that full expression of whatever it's there. Paul talked about connecting with the most silent parts of ourselves, and it reminded me of the peaceful feeling I come to know whenever I take a nice long hike. Between conversations with him and Laura, I simply could not miss the opportunity to check out some of the magical vistas that Sedona has to offer, and investigate the mysterious phenomena known as vortices. 
according to one hipster blog post that I read, a vortex is a site of a great coalescence of energy coming straight from the universe itself. And Sedona is one of the best places in the world to come to experience these vortexes. In Sedona, one of the best places to experience vortexes, in the best place to experience vortexes, that was incredibly repetitive, is Bell Rock. And that's where I am right now. I am, I don't know, about halfway up the rock. And it said in this, uh, in this blog post that the higher up the rock you get, the more energy you feel. So let's keep going. Well, it's all smooth sailing from here in the sense that if I were to try to go any further up this mountain, I would be climbing up an almost perfectly smooth vertical wall of rock. And so for me, that's, uh, that's the end of the line. I'm gonna sit down here for a little while and uh, maybe play a little music and see if I feel anything. But uh, you know, one thing's for certain, it's a hell of a view. In the end, I'm not certain that I felt the vortex energy. I did feel really amazing, but I couldn't distinguish that sensation from the awe and wonder and generally peaceful sense of well-being that I get every time I trudge down a new trail and turn around and find myself in a veritable garden of Eden, surrounded by natural beauty and utterly ensconced from anything that could remind me of the stresses of my own daily grind. And that's why I love hiking so much because it's in that space that I feel that when I look around me, I can see how all of the pieces of the universe fit together. It's like a little acid trip. And speaking of acid trips... One of the things that caught my attention right away about the Cuyamanga Institute are the experiences themselves. People who participate in the rituals report seeing things and hearing things and feeling things and, and going places that remind me of the stories of folks who have taken acid or psilocybin mushrooms. However, in order to have the experiences from the rituals of the Cuyamanga Institute, you don't need to be high at all. The, the experiences that, uh, that folks describe having and, and some, of the, some of the effects that happen on the brain right. uh, seem similar to me to stories I've heard from people who have done. You said that this practice is specifically drug and chemical free. You, you don't need any of that. But sometimes it, it sounds similar to the stories I've heard from people who have done acid or, mm -hmm. or mushrooms or hallucinogenics of that sort. We're probably activating those same pathways. One gal and her first journey with us in a workshop, oh my god, this was every bit as powerful and lucid and vivid as the ayahuasca journey I did last year. Interesting. But I didn't have to throw up. No, so, okay. okay. We want to be able to use the body to access these different elements of the, our experiences. Can it be induced by plant medicine? Absolutely. Is there a natural way that our bodies can have similar experiences? We say yes. Mm -hmm. We're not discounting. Or, or, or having any judgment towards the other. We're just saying we'd like to have our lane represented as well. And that is that there is a natural, physiologically, uh, a physiological opportunity for us to have similar experiences that's already within the biochemistry of our bodies without having to manipulate it through the use of an outside agent. Our message is you have within you a doorway and it's pretty simple to activate it. We're talking about looking at worldwide indigenous art, both whether it's cave walls, whether it's carvings, whether it's sculptures, some kind of some kind of representation within these cultures of these body positions 
that are being represented that just seem outside of the character of like, why would you take the time to draw or to create these artifacts? Why would you they, represent this? What is the or representation this, there or for? This, and what is it meant for? This. The movement of the hands, the movement of the legs, the placement of the arms, the, the placement of the body is like an antenna. And all of a sudden, just like a radio dial, we can tune into specific types of experiences as we get more and more adept at what this posture research has to offer us. And it's been an evolution that's happened significantly. When our recent trip that we took to the caves in, in France, in southern France, and went through a dozen caves. Does that include uh, Les Cow? Yes, oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, we did. And when we did that journey, they said, you know, we used to think that the, the uh, animals on the walls were indications of hunting. We know now that that's not true. These are journeys, these are experiences that they wanted to document from going into some sort of an alternate reality. Yeah. This is not our words. This is the people presenting the work now at these, at these caves. They've come to that conclusion. It's all part of our humanity. It's all part of our own human story. It's not relegated to just one particular culture. And we find many of these artifacts represented not only just in you know, uh, one part of the world or another, but sometimes, like today, it could be 30 or 40 cultures or, or places in the world that have... It's interesting how many artifacts we see in many, many cultures and eras. There are postures that you come to know and befriend because they have a personality to them. They have gifts for you consistently for a healing posture that I know and then a divination posture that I know. And time and time again, we return to those because it's like visiting a friend. You said that some of the postures have, have personalities. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's any analog between uh, the, the way that the, the postures and the, 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 the types of experiences and the themes of the experiences that people get from simply going into this posture? Like it's built in physiologically. Do you think there's any analog between the postures and uh, the idea that Joseph Campbell, I think, talked about of, of mm -hmm. archetypes mm -hmm. uh, within our within the human subconscious that everybody shares, like legends right. Right. that appear right. in, in or, or at least yeah. similar mythical stories that right. appear uh, from one tradition to another uh, across the world. This is more like a spectrum of ourselves, okay. a spectrum of consciousness that we share with a conscious universe. That's that yeah. universality yeah. that's so important for, that we keep bringing, coming back to that point. And that is that these representations, while it might be expressed in, in, in a um, South American particular artifact, or we might find it also in, in, in uh, Asia. Mm. We might find it in Australia. We might find it someplace totally different because that you, that you, it's not owned by one particular section of the planet. There's something deeper, more profound, like Laura's pointing out. That's universal. That universality. That is a shared And we spirit. all tap into it and we try to find what that is. You have a personal engagement with the universe. Mm -hmm. That you get to know these, um, these aspects, archetypes, call them spirit, whatever you want to say. That, they're, that you have a, a personal um, relationship. You get to know the turf. It's warm, it's welcoming, it has touched you on the soul level, it has touched you in the heart, it knows you in some ways better than you know yourself, and it feels like coming home. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. You have peace and comfort and acceptance, and you, you can only respond with gratitude and universal love and, and joy and, and gladness. Another top spot for tourists in Sedona is the Chapel of the Holy Cross. Completed in 1956, it was built into the famous red rocks of the Coconino National Forest as the pilgrimage site, sort of Arizona's version of the Cristo Redentor. Laura told me about the chapel while I was visiting, and I had to go see it for myself. spiritual journey has been much less than straightforward. I was raised Methodist and uh, there have been many times that I felt a pretty wide gulf between my heart and the, the faith that I grew up into. But despite all that, I, I still get really choked up when I come to places like these. Uh, you know, I, I feel it. And at this one, I, I was really 
really, really intrigued by the fact that if you look closely at the crucifix in the background, Christ is being crucified on the tree of knowledge itself. For those of you who don't remember the story, there was Adam and there was Eve. And there was this tree of knowledge thing. And there was this snake guy. And this snake came over and told Eve, yo, you should have one of these apples and you should share it with your buddy Adam. And they did. But then God was angry at them. And before God got angry at them, or maybe at the same time, they felt ashamed. And because they felt ashamed, they went and they found some leaves to cover themselves with. And look at this. I found the original fig. Let me try this this anecdote on okay. really quickly. So I was raised as a Methodist, mm -hmm. and in Method, the, the guy who founded Methodism uh, it was these two brothers. But the main guy that we talked about was John Wesley. Okay. And there's this. Uh, it's not like a holy day, but it's kind of this Methodist holiday that is. I think it's sometime in July every year. But they, the the way they describe the day is it's the day that John Wesley's heart was warmed by God. Mm -hmm. And you go back and you read the story and it's this, it's, I think, um, it's, he wrote it in his journal or his diary or something. And basically he said that today, that day, whatever the day was, he went into a church and he was sitting there and he was trying to listen for God. And he felt, literally he felt mm -hmm. his heart mm -hmm. get warmed. Mm -hmm. And for him, that was when he knew he was called to serve God in a bigger way. Yeah. A big signal. Yeah. So, received. so mm -hmm. for me, when I read, uh, his heart was warm. To, that says warm fuzzies. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. if you know the warm fuzzies feeling, but the oh, yeah. kind of the tingling all over the body. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it's when your beta endorphins, your your positivity mm -hmm. chemical, are are kind of uh, rushing up mm -hmm. and bubbling up. You have, you have this what in high school we literally called it the warm fuzzies all over your body. Mm -hmm. and that sounded like the same thing to me. So in our modern world, it's not for for European and Americans. It's not like this is just gone. But it's that we experience it much less often and on a much smaller scale. Do you think that's fair to say? Mm. In in where? Wow. In 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 the modern European American lifestyle, it's not like we don't have oh, it. Oh, right. And it, it's still mm -hmm. part of our tradition. It's still part of our culture. It's the reason people go to church. I think. Right. Yes. But they just don't actually get that full experience that we used to. We're ecstasy deprived. For some reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. That reason. Our I culture don't really isn't delivering us those experiences. Yeah. And, and it seems and like it's not valuing them either. And it has forbidden. The, the more that I have learned about and researched and, and engaged with uh, ritualized altered states of consciousness, ritualized mm -hmm. being uh, not going out and partying with my friends on the weekend, getting a little too tipsy. And it's an altered state of consciousness, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Yeah. Uh, the more I've engaged with, with this, this ritual type, this, this spiritual type, yeah. The more I, I find myself wanting to f see evidence out there in the world that it still is a part of our tradition today, our religious mm -hmm. traditions, our daily traditions, and and I I, th I think I I think I see them and I find them, but it's it's like it's like you look at something and and the way that the people who created it would talk about it, they would say, oh yeah, it just means this, you know, it's just to stop doing this thing. But then I look at it from having mm -hmm. heard, heard you guys talk so many times and, and read about other traditions, I see it and I say, well, no, that's that's saying this. One of the ones I saw today that, that I told you about before we uh, before we started the discussion, yeah. the see. Chapel of the Holy Cross here in Sedona. Very, Very recent. recently, they mm -hmm. added a large uh, crucifix with Jesus on it inside the chapel. It used to just be the square building with the mm -hmm. cross on the window, but now they've got one inside. And when I was looking at it, I was struck by the fact that the chap the cross itself was made from a tree and you could see golden apples at the mm -hmm. top of the cross and it was clear that that was supposed to say that Christ was being crucified on the same tree of knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate tree from of life the mm -hmm. original the original sin right mm -hmm. and and to me what that said our individual hero's journey the the cross that we each have to bear in our own lives is somehow Living as an adult in this and and being functional in this society, but also recapturing mm -hmm. the the innocence and the purity and the willingness to 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 share and be a member of a community and be supportive of everybody of of other people. That 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 image to me says that Jesus is making up for the fact that 
uh, we, that we, we went to monkey mind. We went to rational. We tried to be all smart and control the world with our intellect and that you just simply can't do that. And, mm-hmm. and, and that the big sacrifice, the whole Christian story is about yeah. coming back from that. And Coming into balance. Yeah, and refining and making home. Making the heart part of the equation. With a human, yeah. with a, an individual direct connection to, yeah. to in what in, in Christianity they call God. And what I think is the same thing you guys call the spirit or the universe mm-hmm. or, or all the mythopoetic terms that you have for it. I, I know a lot of people in my life who are pretty solid Christians and they hear somebody talking about trancing and they're like, oh, that's that's crazy stuff. That's taboo. That's... Uh, there's one person I can think of who would call that like devil worship or something. Sure. And I'd say no, 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 no. It's the exact. Yeah. It's the same thing that you're supposed to be trying to do. And in the back it's of your, your mind, state you reclaimed. know it. Uh, but yeah. you, the tradition has just forgotten yeah. how it works. Well, this is interesting because you're you're coming back to the core yeah. thing of it being a physiologically based practice without a belief system. So it's not discounting Christianity, and it's not a replacement for Christianity, and it's something that is an experiential aspect that can bring forth. Because we know, and, and I am not a religious scholar, so I'm not going to be able to speak to it, but uh, we know that the history of Christianity has its level of mysticism. secret society, mysticism, mm-hmm. of depths of knowledge that was passed on, and also manipulation by those in power, changing some of the messages to meet their own needs. Yeah. And, and so it got co-opted by the kings and, and whatever of the time. The, the rulers of the time said, okay, I'll do this so the people will follow me, and put themselves between the people and Jesus. And so there was something lost at that, that time. I, I thought also coming back to your question, question and I, and that is is that you're saying and I really I, hopefully I tuned in correctly to what you are asking and that is it's great that we keep talking about ancient ancestors and indigenous peoples but you're saying yes but how about the last thousand years of, of, of European history what is it there that carries that flame of knowledge that makes us a part of that 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 tradition uh, that's still alive and well and, and what makes it um, something that we can access. There's always been a way to symbolize the experiences that we're talking about. And whether it's done in a traditional religious uh, context in, 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 in or interpretation of the Bible or, or uh, whatever uh, context that people, people subscribe to, it means that um, this world of alternate reality that we were talking about is widely available and it's been talked about in many, many different languages. See, I wouldn't so much call it the, the, the flame of knowledge or the torch that we're still carrying, but I would say what I, I think I'm seeing is the embers mm. of, of mm. what used to be a great fire that mm-hmm. are now kind of just stuck under the, the charcoal logs, yeah. Yeah. but they're still there, and they're just waiting for somebody to come along and blow on them and, and reignite that fire. Mm. But and each I, of us can add our breath to that. Yeah. And do our do our part. Yeah, keep it alive. and and, there's, and the the yeah. embers are within people who who don't even realize that it's there. Yeah. Let's have direct experience where that mm. lives within you and informs your experience, gives right. you the strength, gives you the vision, gives you the juice to to bring to bring it forth your best self. Right. So. So what's the next step for you guys and for the institute? I have to dinner help, first to help that make <laughs> that happen, and then take a nap. <laughs> and what we're doing is just as Goodman did. Let's bring it. people together from all over the world who hear the call, mm-hmm. who want to discover this this doorway within, and have so much joy and benefit from it yeah. that you naturally come home from your spirit, your hero journey, and you want to then bring it to your community. No matter what your walk of life is, this might be a wonderful tool to help illuminate it. You're probably expecting a call back at this point, but I know that you've had your full of driving shots, so here are some pictures. 30 miles north of Paolo Soleri's Arcasanti is a place that today is known as Montezuma Castle National Monument, but back in its heyday, people around here most often probably just called it home. Delicately perched inside of the cliff face, the town, or in Spanish, Pueblo, 
is both beautiful and practical. With 3,500 feet of indoor floor space, the size of a four-bedroom, four-bathroom house with a living and dining room, it was home to between 30 and 50 people, and may have been the nucleus of a larger neighborhood of agriculturalists living and working in the floodplain of the river below. At the museum adjacent to the Montezuma Castle site, one particular theme seems to pervade the narrative. You see, when the first Spanish people arrived in the area in the 16th century, Montezuma Castle was already abandoned. Where did the people go? Why did they leave? That's the question every exhibit panel tries to answer before ultimately revealing that the most likely scenario is that it was never intended to be a permanent home to begin with. The folks who lived here knew that the great climate conditions along this stretch of the river could not last forever. And so, for that reason, or another, or a combination of many, after 300 years, Montezuma Castle closed its doors, and the people who were living there packed up their things and moved on as they had always been prepared to do. Now, I'm sure it was still hard to say goodbye to the place on moving day. But this perspective really challenges the assumption that a place once inhabited should forever remain so. And it also calls into question the belief that people should aim, as groups and as individuals, to have an impact on society and on the earth, rather than placing value in simply being a part of those things. A part that only in communion with the remainder becomes whole. Montezuma Castle has some striking similarities, both visually and functionally, I believe, with Paolo Soleri's Arcasanti. And it makes me wonder, you know, maybe he wasn't so far ahead of his time, but he was actually looking so far back that people just didn't recognize it. The same can be said for the Cuyamangue Institute. They built a ritual and a community on the foundation of these postures that are so ancient they'd become entirely taken for granted. And the folks I mentioned earlier in the video, the ones who are searching for more meaning than their 9 to 5 gig grind can provide for them, well, they're doing the same too. They're looking back trying to achieve that lightness that comes with embracing impermanence and connecting with something real, something permanent. Unfortunately, though, I think they very often end up finding and latching onto the material manifestations of traditional rituals that have this particular form of enlightenment as their aim. They come away with objects when what they've really been looking for is an idea. You see, ideas are those things that are permanent and that they never really existed to begin with, and so they can never go away, at least not forever. Felicitas Goodman, the founder of the Cuyamungay Institute, knew this, and she was an example of this, acting as a conduit for the remembering of a long-forgotten ritual, a ritual that helps people to access and connect with a part of themselves they might not have even known was there. I don't mean to sound cliche, but I think for me, in my search for that feeling of home, and for other folks in their search for more meaning, I, I think that we'll all come to realize that what we've been searching for was inside each of us all along, just waiting to be uncovered. Through the sound of the rattle and the drum that feature into the Cuyamungay Institute ritual, music moves the hearts of participants. And it transforms the embers of this knowledge into a blazing fire, hot enough to warm the sun. And now that's probably a good moment for me to remind you 
that you want to drink water before participating in a Kuimunge Institute ritual. Now, not so much that you end up having to go to the bathroom right in the middle of the trance, but uh, you know, it's just always good to be hydrated. And we're trying to work within a world that we live in, uh, with all that's happening with technology and multimedia and, and social media and this and that. But at the same time, we're supposed to be a practice of just contacting this higher part of ourselves. It will speak to people at yeah. its own level. One of the things I want to end on is just respecting Dr. Goodman. And when I met this lady, she was totally at peace with the fact that she had this little piece of land and she had these multiple buildings and people would come from Europe. People would come from, and they'd come sit with her in the summertime. And she says, yes, come. Let's from all over the U.S. We'll and We'll have Canada. classes. We'll have things. Yeah. We'll teach. We'll go into the kiva together. Yeah. We'll make food together. I'll make the food. Whatever you need. Let's have fun together. She wasn't into the promotional aspect of being constantly driven by being discovered. She yeah. was simply happy holding a place for the knowledge to exist. So for the viewers who have, uh, have never tried anything with the, the Queen Ling Institute before, but after watching this, they're just all amped up and ready to go. Where can they find you? <laughs> well, queermongainstitute.com. And I know queermonge is a strange word for most people. <laughs> C-U-Y-A-M-U-N-G-U-E. It's the name of the place. It's the land that Dr. Goodman purchased. It goes back. An ancient, it's an ancient uh, village site there in the Pueblo world. So queermongainstitute.com. So I headed up to the forest to find my way I was thinking to encounter a pine tree and call my name Instead I met a bear with golden claws Carved from the hearts of a hundred different stars She pointed up to the skies and she showed me peace As a warm glow started emerging from the east Time stood still for a matter of years, my friend Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish I didn't have to begin again You won't believe unless you saw it You wouldn't understand unless you knew You won't be able to spell it even if it wrote down the entire alphabet for you But still it's true Yeah, so I reached my stopping point, and then I came around the corner of the mountain, and I saw a couple people, and they were looking at me, they said, oh, is this the way up? And I said, well, I didn't say anything. I said, I don't know, I stopped. But then I looked at them, and I thought, oh my gosh, are you serious? Here's one right there, he's taking a selfie. Look at this. Oh, you can't see it, right? There. All I could think was, how are you getting down? <laughs>